Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to twitch.tv slash ESPN Esports. We are talking all things Valorant. A very busy week, whether it's the patch notes, the game being updated, a possible new map, big changes in competitive organizations, signing new players, marquee players from different esports. We have a lot to digest. I'm Art O'Cal. We got Emily Rand and we got David Simo Rabinovich with us as well. David, fresh off of commentating our ESPN Esports. <laughs> Esports Valorant Woo. Invitational, uh, which was won uh, surprisingly by Team Canyon. Uh, that was definitely not predicted by a lot of people, Simo. But here we are. It's the Apex <laughs> Legends boys that are reigning supreme. Are you surprised by that? You know, you think that Team Mirage came in. They had a lot of strats patented out by the previous Invitationals that they attended. But Team Canyon proved that they took the practice to the court and they were able to come out on top. And good for them. Good for them. What do you think, Emily? Were you surprised? Um, I was like, like pleasantly surprised, I guess, because I mean, previously we identified Team Canyon as the only uh, kind of the only other team that we saw having a shot at winning this tournament outside of the developers and all of the former CS:GO uh, pros. I think that the big thing that I saw from the Apex Legends players that was really interesting is how they adapted from day to day. Especially uh, since they played, Dizzy played so much Raze on the on their first day of competition, oh, yeah. and then uh, swapped to the Breach, which he looked not great on in their first few matches, and then was like significantly better on by the end of the day. So just to see that kind of like comfort level change within the course of a day is always like super interesting. Um, and I, I think it was really cool how they obviously adapted and also just. Their, their team coordination and synergy by the end of the tournament was a lot better than when they started. I think it was Tyler at Fion on Fire on Twitter that wrote in our Slack chat. He said, Dizzy basically went from trash tier to god tier in an hour on a new <laughs> character in a tournament. I mean, I, w I wouldn't say trash tier, but his breach wasn't great when he first started, and it was really good by the end of the day. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, the big moves and signings that have happened a little bit later on. That's going to come later in the program. Let's start with the patch notes and also Valorant competitive. Now, we were expecting to receive a ranked mode today, but Valorant tweeted a, a few hours ago this. For those asking for rank to be turned on, not today, sorry. We're evaluating on a day-to-day -day basis based on server stability and competitive integrity of the queues. Examples, no uncounterable exploits. Today is not that day. We'll let you know tomorrow. Now, I appreciate the openness. And, and to be fair, the developers have been very open with communication mm -hmm. thus far in the closed beta. Do you think that this is going to be an elongated process? Do you think maybe we'll get ranked tomorrow or next week? And do you care? How much does it matter to you that we get it as soon as possible, Emily? Um, so I think that they'll definitely try to enable ranked as soon as possible when they think that they can. I know like some people are still having massive connectivity issues. For example, all of the games I played yesterday were 4 5 um, uh, unfortunately, they were 45 for our opponents, uh, but the, even even as like the five, that still feels really bad, right? And obviously people are continuing uh, to drop off the server at times. Uh, they've still had a few server issues since the previous patch. Um, so I think it's a good idea to delay ranked until they can make sure that they won't have significantly more issues when it is enabled. Um, as for whether it's like good or bad, I mean, I always think it's good when something's delayed if it's not ready to be launched. Um, when Ranked does uh, go live, um, I think it'll be really nice for for matchmaking. I know like for me as a player, like as a casual player, it's always going to be really hard uh, for me to queue up because A, I'm really bad. B, I'm a woman, and this voice chat mm. is actually super important in this. Um, so I don't know how much like ranked is going to affect me because I'm probably only going to be playing with friends, to be quite honest. But I think it's really, really good to establish a ranked system, not only for um, players that we're going to talk about swapping from other games later on in this, but for people who are new and are just coming out. Like I've said this pre on previous shows, and I'll reiterate it later and here now. Um, I think the the future of Valorant is in people that we probably don't even know yet, and ranked right. is going to significantly help with scouting those people, right? So uh, that that's where I think ranked has a, a really good value, in addition to you know improved quality of life for matchmaking and and that kind of stuff that naturally will come with it. 
let's talk about some of the patch notes. It, a lot of it was relatively minor, but there were some interesting points in there, Simo. When you take a look at this, why not? Why don't we highlight maybe one or two things that really stuck out for you from the patch notes? One of the main things I feel like is a lot of people have been putting Cypher in kind of the S tier of agents, considering how useful his utility is when it comes to scouting out the opposition. Um, they've recently made a change where the Cypher camera blinks now when it is active by the Cypher um, that is using it. It's a green light that is blinking for allies, so it signifies, okay, this is a team camera, this is not an enemy camera, and it's red if it's an opposing Cypher's spy cam. So I think that can be very useful. Um, and little changes like that can really change the, the pace of a game, potentially, knowing that, okay, I can now push in. Maybe it's, it's not blinking, maybe I can sneak by or something like that, and, and that indication can now help out as well. In addition to Omen, now it's a little bit easier to tell um, when he comes out from, from the shadows and from there. I mean, to, to Omen players, it might feel like a little bit of a nerf because now it's like, well, uh, the element of surprise is, there, is missing, but it still needed to be a little bit more clear for especially the newer players that might be coming in after the closed beta when the game launches to tell, okay, Omen's in, I can take him down now, and um, I can have a 4v5 advantage for my team. That's an important one. Also, Sage with the uh, barrier orb, Emily. That's a mm -hmm. uh, big one as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the, like, we were talking about this before we went live, but um, Sage is, like, the crux of every team composition, right? Like, by, desi by design, like, she is going to be in every comp, and I actually don't mind that. Like, I don't, I don't know what the developers think, but I honestly don't mind that she's a necessary component. It does mean that balance balancing her is really tricky without, like, changing her entire kit. And so balance is typically going to come from stuff like this, where you notice that if you can put a barrier on like every single little tiny piece and you're boosting everyone um, to like, you know, <laughs> places that the developers didn't necessarily uh, anticipate, um, that is, you know, a bit a bit overtuned. And therefore, uh, I, I actually do like that update a lot um and i think it's it's a really good example of the value of a of a beta in it in and of itself right because a care uh, an agent like sage is always going to be a bit trickier to tweak uh just based on the way her kit's designed i think that a lot of people have figured out special peaks uh to be to get an advantage with the barrier orb and one that has been fixed with the patch uh is at haven at the double doors there's a curtain now so that you can't create the barrier orb and then just peek at the sliver right at the top uh to uh, be able to see this is some of the more visual changes here you'll notice that that hue of green teal turquoise whatever you want to call it that's really like the color of Valorant, right? Like that's like the primary color of Valorant. So you're going to see that a lot. And you're also going to see that color in some of the character updates as well. Omen and Breach now have that color incorporated into their kits. Uh, but I think it looks nice. I think that when you have a primary color like that differentiating, there's Breach right there. Uh, I think that that is a positive for a game from like a, you know, memory standpoint, from a identification standpoint, Simo. Yeah, I agree. And one of the main, at least important things I've heard from a few CS, you know, uh, analysts and commentators and players is that as long as they don't create a big difference in the actual character model itself, like if you re um, refer back to Overwatch, Reinhardt is way bigger than May, of course, as long as you as long as the models themselves remain relatively the same size, they can uh, keep it on brand as much as possible and everyone will still follow suit. And like you said, it still will help with that memory thing. But as long as the models themselves don't change too drastically in terms of size, um, they can change them as much as they want. What about the omen lines on the face too? Like we're gonna get <laughs> to that in a second. That's he has the creepiest lines in the game, by the way. <laughs> right? Like like Cypher, have you seen under my hood? Does it scare you? Like, where'd that come from? What on earth is that? Listen, Omen know. has a dark past, you know? You, yeah. you don't know I where mean, he's coming from. Yeah. Some of these voice lines, I just, like, crack up all the time when people are spamming them, just generally. Another thing I do want to mention really quick about the patch notes is the... Um, the observer mode. So there were a few things added to the observer mode. And these are minor things like maybe some of you watching uh, won't even ever use the observer mode. But 
there are some quality of life improvements that were made to that mode, which will make tournament viewing a lot better, Simo, right? You've done a lot of Valorant tournaments right now. You've experienced observer mode. So when you see improvements coming from that aspect, that's very bright. That's very encouraging. Yeah, especially considering it's still a close beta. There's still kinks to iron out across the board, even observing mode or not. Um, some of the changes, I think, are still good, but there's a long way to go for it to be perfect. I think um, what they incorporated for us to start, switching between players as well as the free cam to allow um, some of the montages that you may have seen. I think Team Liquid released a montage that has some cool little neat angles. We had some of them during the ESPN Esports Valorant Invitational, but there's still, I think, a lot more to be added um, in order for, I think, even the devs to be happy with the place um, that they want the Observer Mode to be in. So, I mean, this is just one of many. I'm sure that we're going to get a lot more patch notes in the near future, but so far, so good. And again, the, the communication has been incredible. So props to the Valorant team, particularly the designers, the producers that are putting out these patch notes and the communications team that worked on this. I believe the gentleman's name was Jeff Landa, communications associate. So Jeff, thank you for this. Appreciate the details there. And we did put the link in the chat. So let's talk about some of the announcements. Emily. So Yo. you and I, participate in a weekly Overwatch League roundtable. Mm -hmm. We talk about the state of the league, and we talk about yeah. some of the challenges in Season 3. Okay? Uh, some of us have strong opinions. Others have strong opinions. We do. We we often talk it's about... We all have strong opinions. We certainly do. We talk about the challenges <laughs> of that league. And then, this week, the star of the league, the most prominent player, the one that was on The Tonight Show, the one that's the reigning MVP, the one that's the reigning champion, and represented his country to a gold medal, decides mid-season, by the way, middle of the season, I'm done. Not passionate about the game anymore. I gotta leave. He leaves Overwatch League, pursues a professional Valorant career. I want to hear every single one of your reactions. I've been looking forward to this. Please tell me your reaction when you first heard this. Um, I was like, wow, that's a really bad look for Overwatch is my is my first uh, my first thing, like just the the optics on that after them having already such a rough season with so many delays and not being able to launch in China and South Korea like they wanted to with homestands. That's just a really terrible look for them. You know, like they the optics were already pretty bad going into this season. Um, but now this is you know, uh, an extra layer of just really, really terrible looks for the league. Uh, I'm I'm really happy. I don't know if you read his tweet longer where he talks about like why he left and yeah. um, like he, how he lost passion for the game and he wasn't sure why uh, why this happened. But and he like really thought uh, a, a lot about this to the point where it made him sick. Um, I think that he's someone who wouldn't just like jump ship a without thinking about it and b it's credit to nrg and the shock that they didn't try to be like no we're gonna force you to stay and like you know play this game that you obviously don't want to play anymore um so i think i mean honestly like it, it speaks well of both parties i think and how they handled it um which is always like i don't know with with so many like terrible esports partings, you like to see one that's like actually amicable with people acting like adults. It's very refreshing. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, I think the the big thing that we're about to talk about is pe how many people are we now going to see jumping ship going into Valorant, despite the fact that it is a game that doesn't even have uh, hasn't even launched yet. Um, right. And I and I think the big thing with Sinatra and the reason why I think he uh, should be an outlier, but I know that a lot of people might follow suit, is that he has achieved, uh, if you look back on his Overwatch career, uh, he has achieved uh, pretty much everything that you kind of could achieve. You know, like he he won a season. Um, he won a, a World Cup. He went from being like, he even jokes around about this. He's like, I was, he says to Krusty, like, I was so bad until you came on to coach me. Um, like he, he improved immensely as a player. Um, and so I feel like someone in his position, who's obviously very good at, at FPS games, uh, as much as we and people dunked on team heroes, they actually mm -hmm. made a lot further 
Um, yeah. And I think, while I don't think there's a one-to-one -one comparison between Overwatch and Valorant like there is from CS to Valorant, I do think that um, if you have decent FPS mechanics, you can step into Valorant and do really well. Sinatra is someone who has always had very like good FPS mechanics, so he should be able to make the jump maybe a bit more easy than others. Now, do I think everyone should follow suit? No, I think that'd probably be a terrible career move for a lot of people. But for Sinatra specifically, I don't think it's a bad move, especially if he hates playing Overwatch as much as he says he does. Fair enough. David, I, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. Just a couple of things on what Emily just said there. Um, Sinatra's options, and this was reported first by Tyler Erzberger and Jacob Wolf on ESPN.com slash esports. The reason for the switch... Uh, this is a paragraph from their article. Sinatra's options for entering Valorant as a pro were limited because the Overwatch League barred retiring players. And, and to be clear, Sinatra retired from professional Overwatch in order to make this switch. The Overwatch League barred retiring players from signing with the parent or sister organization of any competing team, sources said. In Sinatra's case... Uh, whose shock operate under NRG Esports. He could have played for NRG, which is putting together a Valorant squad of its own, but not the parent or sister organization of any other team in the league. So he decided to leave NRG and join Sentinels. Sentinels, of course, is famous for having the current Halo World Champions and also, obviously, Booga, the Fortnite World Cup winner. So now they have a formidable roster. They actually... It's funny to watch all of this, right? Like, as soon as our, the article from Jacob and Tyler went up, it felt like everybody's timelines to announce got bumped up several days because all of a sudden you got Sinatra saying oh I wasn't ready for this I'm going to write a twit longer and then you had Sentinels 10 minutes later throwing up their roster it almost felt like they had a plan in place but it got completely out of sorts as a result uh, but David we we talked about this at length at, on the Invitational about how so many of those players, Bustio is an example, Psalm is an example, coming from different FPS titles and making their intentions known that they want to be Valorant pros, right? So as much as we say this might be an outlier, do you think that we're going to see a lot more of this, a hefty amount, even from star players of other leagues and other esports as we go along here? I think so. It, it'll definitely be sprinkled kind of in between a lot of different esports. But what I really want to think about is what does this do to the tier list of different esports? Obviously, we know League of Legends and CSGO and Dota 2 are at the top of that tier list. But where does that put Overwatch after this move? And if more Overwatch players start to move, what is going to happen to where Overwatch kind of sits amongst all the esports um, and kind of the bigger picture? And then when Valorant starts to develop their own esports scene, where will that put them in the tier list? Will all this... Um, will this big giant hype train that's chugging along with all these players right on right on board, will that move along with them? Will they climb the ranks too? Will now Valorant bump up from a tier four to a tier three to a tier two? Will that happen? We can only wait and see. So it's a really a really interesting jump. And um, you can definitely expect more jumps to come along in the coming weeks. See, Emily, I feel like this sets such a bad precedent for Overwatch League in general, right? Like if Sinatra can go then any player will be motivated by that. The guy was making $150,000. Yeah. Now, we don't know how much money he's making. I'm going to guess that it's more. I'm I just going to so, guess. So my opinion on like Sinatra leaving, A, if you're, if you're not Sinatra, you should still seriously think about your options for reasons that I don't, I don't know if you want me to get into the Valorant esports thing as a whole now, or I know we have a topic on it later. Go ahead, but, um, no, the the other thing that I'll I'll touch upon first is that I think Overwatch League was already in a lot of trouble. Uh, we did a roundtable that hasn't been released yet, as far as I know, like on the editorial side. But I know I read your parts and you read my parts, um, where we talked about like a we lot. We read of, a lot, by the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we're we're not like butting heads on this. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the issues surrounding Overwatch League, right? that have nothing to do with Valorant coming. Like, sure, Valorant is going to take some of these players. Like, And I actually think of all of the like major esports that people think of, Valorant is probably in the most trouble um, outside of like Apex, but I don't think people thought of that as a major esports scene. Um, I think the the big thing is that like there are so many other issues with Overwatch, like the, the amateur tier two, tier three scene has been like consistently gutted um, for reasons that I can only think of are just to have a more immediate ROI from the top, 
like a, a kind of like venture capital look at like we need more of a return on our investment immediately, um, especially with some of the contracts that we're giving players. That's me like presuming a lot, but that's the only thing I can think of as to why that they've consistently like basically chopped away at their own infrastructure in in tier two and tier three. Um, I think that's a problem. I think a lot of the things of the game itself is a problem. I think in some cases they've been t- overly eager and too proactive to change things uh, too much, like hero pools. I think in some cases they've been uh, overly slow and reactive to things like last year with the GOATS meta. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's like there's a lot of things at work here, but the the main thing for me is um, they because of the global pandemic, they weren't able to launch in, in China and South Korea like they would have wanted to. Uh, and I heard all of those homestands were sold out and that could have been a massive boost for the game itself in those two countries, which would have been a really, a, that was a thing that they kind of needed already. Um, and this entire global launch was, just a massive undertaking that I've only ever seen one geolocated league work. It is the LPL. It is a ma- like League of Legends is already a major sport in China, so you can't compare the a fan base the size of China to anything else in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and on top of that, not all teams are even geolocated. It's only like six of them. So this was like a multi-continent travel uh that was then shut down by a global pandemic on top of chopping away at the tier two tier three scene i mean it was already looking not great for overwatch coming into this year the sinatra thing just makes it look so much worse yeah it's such a black eye i agree with you like optically this is one of the worst things at this time for that league that could have happened (laughs) it just looks so bad like your star player leaves doesn't even want to defend his championship or his MVP. Nap, I'm done. You know, like I, I'm going to go to green. Like it just says a lot about both Valorant as a potential and how people perceive it, but also how people perceive Overwatch League right now, or at least some people. So, so here, here's 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 the follow up question to that, Simo. When you look at different titles, and in particular the big ticket ones that we've heard so far, Psalm and Sinatra are really the two biggest players. I guess you can include Brax in that as well. But but really, I'm talking about the titles that... Like, CSGO is going to be a natural transition. I think we're going to probably see, in terms of volume, the most players make that transition. But what about the titles where the players feel like they might have a better career or a better way of life in Valorant as opposed to their own titles, right? Like Fortnite, like... Overwatch League, like or, or Overwatch in general, like, what do you think we will see in the next six months, and and how how deep are orgs going to be looking for players? Like, how how long will this last before the ranked system shows us who truly is good, and 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 all of a sudden that's what's going to matter the most? Well, I think that's what the rank system is essentially designed to do. Obviously, right? The immortal rank is going to weed out who's good and who's bad. Are those social media clips that some of these um you know looking for team players uh are they actually real are you actually performing at the highest possible level um and the immortal rank will show us and knowing from riot that they like to invest into the amateur scene and they like to um really support up and coming players i think you'll see a lot of that come out in the next six months as well Uh, riot has obviously gone on record to say okay we want to invest into the esports scene they have developers that have been in the esports scene developing this game so this obviously means a lot to them to build that up from the ground up. Um, And for a lot of players, even from CSGO, this is a redemption arc for them to start a new life in a new game, right? Um, You talk about players like Brax and AZK. This is their movement to uh, refresh their image and bring a whole new look on their own play style. But then for players coming from like PUBG, from Apex Legends, like you said, Fortnite as well, this is also an opportunity for them to say, hey, I can still compete in an FPS. Let me have a shot. Let me have a chance. Um, but it's all I feel like going to really rely on the amateur scene and that immortal rank. I think it's going to be super crucial for some of these up and coming players. Let's yeah. talk about. Yeah, go ahead, Emily. Sorry. Oh no, I was just going to say this. His points kind of dovetail into something I just want to talk about um, generally from a, a larger like business perspective. Because right now we see a ton of orgs rushing to get into Valorant. Um, they're going to be spending a lot of money like right off the bat. Um, in a in a world where we don't have a rank system yet, and I, I still do think that 
the best players in this game are probably not going to come from other games. They're going to come from people who are native that just start playing the game, end up loving it. Um, like some random young kid that's going to start playing on on the ladder when it's launched. Um, I think that the other point to make is that, and another reason why I think like Sinatra should be the outlier and not necessarily a model to follow, is that because Riot has specifically said, we're going to let this grow organically, right? Like we're going to take a step back. We're going to have third party tournament organizers. We're not going to do a top down thing like a franchise system right off the bat, which I actually so like for me personally, I think that's great. I think you do need time for the game to take off. I, do, I think you do need time for it to grow. I think per, in particular, when this hits in Korea and China, it's going to be massive, especially if it catches on in China, which is what that'll be like insane. The amount of money you'll see people throwing around in there to try <laughs> to play this game. Um, but I think because it's going to grow organically, that does give me a bit of hesitation from a business perspective. And I don't want to be a downer, but let's go. Um, there's a global <laughs> pa- there's a global pandemic going on right now. Uh, businesses are looking for either A, an immediate ROI on everything that they enter, or B, um, at least some like some sort of uh, guarantee that they'll be able to make money off of something unless they are so rich uh, and they just want to have a team for the heck of it. If you're like Wong Sikong or something and you own Invictus Gaming and you want to pick up a Valorant team, like go at it, man. Like, you know, you have enough money to spend probably. Um, But that means that I feel like this is, these these two things are weirdly at odds with each other, right? Because a top-down franchise system I don't want that implemented right off the bat. I like stress. For me personally, I love what Riot's doing with this. However, without a top-down franchise system, it does mean that I think some of these companies are going to feel less financial security going into Valorant, especially since we don't know who the third-party tournament organizers are. And historically, any third-party tournament organizer for Riot and then also later for Blizzard's Overwatch then had the broadcast taken back by the developer itself, right? Which again, I'm not like complaining about. I'm just saying that some of these things entering Valorant are all at odds with each other, especially in building a grassroots scene, because you can't do that now. Everyone expects you to just immediately come in and be an esport, right? And that <laughs> wasn't a thing when League was coming That's a good up. Point. Like it Where? wasn't. Um, you know, like and it wasn't a thing when like People were playing COD friendly tournaments for like five dollars and a hot dog. Like, you know, it's not like there's there's an expectation now because so many of these like larger businesses or because so many of these VC funded um companies are entering the scene that I'm very curious to see how this shakes out, especially since we're at a time where people are not spending money. But Orgs are spending money. That's the interesting right. thing. And established orgs are spending money. T1 is an established brand, right? Like they are spending money. In fact, they were the first org to sign a Valorant Pro. Brax is the very first Valorant Pro, and he had zero seconds on the game before he got signed. So so, so my question gender. for that is like, what is their expectation? Because so, the way I see way, the way yeah. T1 is investing right now, it's almost like a... Like, I mean, I'm not going to compare him to or T1 to like Wong Sekong, but like it's almost that kind of attitude, right? Like where we're using this as a platform for advertising. We want to be in the esports space regardless. We're not looking to make a ton of money off of this Valorant team. And that's fine. Like that that's totally fine. That's why I don't think T1 is going to have any issues, honestly, because so, I think that's their approach to investment. OK, so. Let's generalize it. Let me put you guys, and we can make this all three of us. Let's say we had orgs, well-established esports orgs, okay? And now we're seeing this happen, okay? Simo, tell me, you own an org, you see Valorant come out, closed alpha happens, you get all the information. Let's say you have some moles there, or maybe you were even invited yourself if you're an eight shot, and you go through it all, and you understand, you know who the best players are, at least in the closed alpha. Then the closed beta happens, and you're getting information, you're watching streams, whatever. Okay, what do you think the best approach is? Is the best approach to get in the market now to hire and sign who you think will be the best (laughs) players, throw money at them, let them grab the bag, or are you patient? Do you wait for ranked? And then do you wait a few months after ranked 
to really find out where those diamonds in the rough are? What approach are you taking? Ooh, this is such a, a very loaded question. <laughs> if there's any team owners in the chat, I'm sorry. Um, but um, I'm asking your opinion. Yeah, no, not- I know, I know, I know. Um, to me, I, I think it, it's honestly a wait and see. I feel like maybe some teams have that uh, FOMO feeling. They have this fear that they're missing out on players that they may not have access to down the line because just because the, the a lot of teams are scooping up players in the closed beta. I think one of the most important things for an eSport once it starts to... Uh, flourish is esports hours watched and I would have to really watch that carefully to see okay there's tournaments going on people are watching tournaments but how how many people are watching tournaments how many hours are being watched and how does that compare to the other esports and very particularly how does that compare to other FPS esports mm-hmm. are is viewership declining in CSGO is viewership declining in Apex if Valorant viewership is starting to take over some of these games a month in, two months in, three months in, six months in, then it might actually start to be a worthy investment because then I can transition that into advertisement. I can market my players. I can market the team as a good package deal. I still think it may be too early for that. Yes, there's been a lot of invitationals and a lot of teams have been able to capitalize on the viewership. G2, 100 Thieves, T1. They've all done a great job on their tournaments and they've been able to capitalize exactly on what they needed, the viewership. But it, I think it's still too early to tell if that's going to translate six months down the road, a month down the road. I know esports moves fast, but I don't think it's fast enough for you to buy a team just yet. I am going to make myself the daughter of a very wealthy Chinese businessman in this scenario. <laughs> so you have an unlimited resource. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so actually, I no. I just parameters on this. I know. But... <laughs> like, right? like you're you're not reining me in here, are you? Come on. Okay. Um, I think, uh, like, so jokes aside, I think what we're actually going to see is uh, somewhat what we saw in the beginning of Overwatch. And again, I know people like to dunk on Overwatch a lot now, and we've spent a lot of time on the show right now dunking on Overwatch for, I think, our valid reasons. Um, but if you remember when it was launched, it was like in insanely popular launch. Everyone was looking to get into it. You saw a lot of established orgs getting in right off the bat, picking up Overwatch teams um, before the league was announced, right? So for about, what, like half a year or so? It was was actually like a pretty short amount of time before we started to see teams drop out because they didn't want to enter the league for whatever reason because the price was too high or they didn't, they got outbid by, uh, you know, a, a more like desirable partner in the league's eyes for whatever reason, and then we saw them dropping their teams, right? Um, I think that we're going to see some of that in Valorant, but it's also going to depend on how the esports space evolves. And more of what I think we'll see is teams picking up players for now that are transitioning from other games. And then as we start seeing the the ladder uh, really bump some unknown players up, uh, whether they're transitioning from other games or not, um, then we'll really start to see orgs uh, investing or at least uh, picking up different players other than like the big headlining ones. Like for example, AZK and Brax, like they were, you know, because of the I buy power thing, they weren't allowed to play CS anyway. And that obviously like they're, they're both incredibly skilled players. So that's, that's a really easy, easy pickup that, you know, probably isn't going to disappoint you um, and they're not going to get surpassed immediately. Right. Um, And I do want to touch on the fact that I do think this game, if it goes off in China, is going to be like the again that I can't stress like I I know I try to bring everything back to like Chinese business because my main league is the Lull Pro League in China. But I can't stress enough how insane things will get if this does manage to take off there. And if you have a lot of these like massive Chinese orgs suddenly investing a lot of money into uh, Valorant teams, because again, like a lot of these orgs, they're just using it as like a random marketing arm. Like Billy Billy doesn't need to necessarily make uh, a return on investment on their League of Legends team. They probably do because they have so much merch, but that like they don't need to. Uh, and and when you have organizations that are that rich and are still willing to spend that much money, especially right now at a time where people don't want to spend as much money, uh, that's a, that would actually be huge for the scene. Um, if when it launches in China, you see Chinese orgs picking up teams. And look, you you and I have both talked about this at length. We we have talked about this at length in articles, in past streams. Valorant, Riot Games has the best opportunity to make their FPS title 
universally mm -hmm. accepted. Asia, yep. Europe, North America, you name it, around the globe, Valorant has the potential. It is best positioned to do so. Whether it happens remains to be seen. But yes. uh, tying a bow on the business conversation, here's another <laughs> pie in the sky question that just came up. Uh, let's say it's a franchise league in two years. What do you think a franchise is worth? I'm, I'm honestly thinking about this. Is it is it 30 million? Is it 40 million? Is it 50 million? Is it more? Is it less? I think it's less. I mean, like if it you see less? if you see a lot of these valuations and what people were throwing into Overwatch League and COD, I think people are realizing that those numbers are probably a bit inflated. Whereas LCS was only what like 10, 10, 10 million, million, right? 10 million. So yeah, so I think like. Um, again, like putting, 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 China, putting China aside, I think it's perfectly valued, actually. I think yeah, they did a really smart thing yeah. with that valuation. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, I think it's also another uh, interesting business thing that I should have mentioned regarding South Korea that I didn't yet is that uh, League of Legends, uh, the Champions Korea is franchising this coming year as well. Um, so we'll see a lot of and like there's kind of a as healthy of an esports scene as South Korea is, there's a finite amount of businesses they're willing to put money into esports in South Korea. So you're either looking at Western or or Chinese partners coming in. Um, but that, but I do think that that's also something that people should keep their eye on as well as the valuation of those teams. Um, because actually, I I think like uh, I I don't think like you want to go 30, 40 million. I think you want to stay at like a, a nice cool like 10, 15. USD. A nice cool 10 A nice cool 10 million. I mean, I'll never I, I wish I had money, a nice cool 10 I know, million. right? Like that's, that's yeah. on the low end. Uh, um there's a question in the chat actually. This is off topic but still. Uh Rye guy 2133 says is there an actual release date for the game? We know it's summer, right? Like is there a date or a month at least that Riot Games has told us? Nothing, right? I think I heard June, but I think it's still really no one knows I think at this point. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Simo, why don't we dive into some of the players? Uh, T1, obviously, uh, AZK and Brax we saw in the Valorant Invitational here at ESPN Esports. Uh, Crashies is also now involved. That's a recent develop development with Sentinels. Uh, we have players from three different titles. We have Sinatra coming from Overwatch. We have Zoms coming from Apex Legends. He was already part of the Sentinels roster. And then we have Shazam and Sick who are coming from CSGO. So uh, feel free to pick like any players from those rosters that stick out to you or who you've been impressed with or you think needs improvement. Uh, what do you make of those two rosters? I think my eyes are always going to be on the CSGO players that are transitioning through just based on how um, I've seen the Team Mirage roster in previous invitationals just do so phenomenally well. Um, I'm going to be paying attention to all the players that enter into the scene. Shazam and Sink, Sick have a lot of previous synergy that they've played on together on different teams. TSM, Misfits, Complexity. Mm -hmm. You can expect to see that same similar synergy. And when you've got agents that have um, abilities that need to be intertwined together, you can expect that synergy to transfer over. And the same applies for Brax and AZK. We saw them during the Invitational go on an absolute tear. Unfortunately, they didn't win, of course. Team Canyon had the better um, <laughs> odds against them that day. But you're still looking for, I think, package players that will come through. And you can see that with Sentinels. You can see that with T1. And you can only expect maybe not individual players from CSGO jumping ship, but it's going to be like duos or trios that come in and they join teams and they keep that synergy going. And then you just have these raw talents in, let's say, Sinatra, Zoms, and in the case, Crashies as well. You have these raw talents that will come in and they'll supplement the rosters in the case for Sentinels and T1. Now, Shazam and Sick were actually on the same CSGO team, to your point there, with Misfits, where they made it to the semifinals. I believe it was 2017. Uh, yeah, it was ESL Pro League yeah. uh, Season 6 Finals in Denmark, 2017. So they have a lot of experience together as well. Um, Emily, what uh, when you look at these rosters or even some players that impressed you from the tournament, like who, who do you have your eye on to really make a splash in Valorant? I want someone to pick up Pico. Really bad. I think yeah. he he honestly oh, yeah. impressed me more than any other player in in the event. Um, but I think Simo actually makes a really really good point in that this specific game is so heavily dependent on communication. Um, it doesn't have the same like I know when when we first saw like sketches of Valorant and and heard whispers about it, people were like it's CS meets Overwatch, and I think the Overwatch part is a bit. Uh, speech like specious comparison now that we know more about the game the, the cs comparison is a lot more apt 
But synergizing abilities and constantly communicating out positions on the map it is super key. And you want to have people that you already have good synergy and you have good communication with. Um, and, and that's actually why I was going to also highlight Shazam and Sick too, because I think if you can translate that kind of synergy, uh, if you already have that kind of synergy, rather, it will translate into a new game just as well as like your actual skills from CS will. Um, and, and honestly, like I think that's the the most important thing when we look at teams that will be successful, it's going to be teams that communicate the best. Like that was that was what was so impressive about the way that Team Mirage played for for most of the tournaments that they've been in, right? Or like the the former CS:GO team um, in the T1 Invitational in our own Invitational is not even necessarily that they were like clicking the most heads. I mean, they were winning their gunfights, <laughs> sure, but like they they were just so well communicative, right? And they they already knew like the in my opinion like the best base composition to use, right? Um, and that that goes like an incredibly long way in this game. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Bustio in this conversation as well. Uh, actually, uh, interesting story. So after Team Heroes were eliminated from the tournament, and, and they had a great game against Team Six uh, in, in order to qualify for the playoffs, and they pushed uh, their semifinal match to the limit. Mm. They, they really made it competitive there. And Bustio led the way for much of the game, uh, especially in... in in uh, KDAs and in one-on-one -on -one gunfights, you could tell that he was really leading the way there. Uh, and he told me after the tournament that orcs had already started to reach out to him. I, I don't know oh, where great. he is in the process, but Good he did get some. Yeah, he did get some inquiries from either aid, uh, managers, agents, whatever, or people representation or organizations. So that's great to see that you know you have a good performance like that in a tournament that is being watched, and all of a sudden. You're getting noticed and people are reaching out to you. Um, let me let me ask this question. Mechanically, just from a mechanical standpoint, I'm going to throw the name Dizzy out there. Uh, maybe no surprise, but I just felt like especially like, and not just his social media clips, but I feel like in our, even, even, even in the switch after the patch, by the way, there was a patch mid-tournament. In our in our in Valorant Invitational, like they nerfed Rays mid tournament, mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, Dizzy had it. to adapt. Yeah, right. Dizzy had to adapt, but like I felt like he. I don't know. I don't know if there's a stat on one on one gunfights, but I feel like Dizzy there would be, be at like eighty percent. I don't know. It, it, it just it just feels like he wins every single engagement he's in. If it's one on one and he has a clear vision and he doesn't and the other opponent doesn't get the drop on him or like sneaks up on him and even some of that time he'll get the he'll he'll do a 180 and get the kill anyway. I just feel like he might be the most mechanically sound player I've seen in a, in an FPS. Uh, tell me some names that come to mind when you think of mechanics. I mean, I feel like Kellar was a weird surprise to me. I thought he was winning almost all of his gunfights, actually, like even more so than yeah. Dizzy in terms of like 1v1s and 1v2s. Uh, but I might be mistaken because I actually don't have statistics to back, back me up on that <laughs> just by memory. So like, don't quote me on that. Um, I mean, honestly, like, I guess Dizzy's up there. I think Ace definitely wants to make it or Ace you, however uh, you want to say his name. Um, I think a lot of the kind of highlight real plays that, that he does, uh, you know, uh, again, that'll translate. Um, I don't know. For me, it was, I was definitely paying attention more to like how teams were, were coordinating and using their compositions and like raw 1v1 gunfights. But, okay. but now that you mentioned like 1v1s, Kalar immediately came to mind just because I felt like. Mm -hmm. So many of their matches came down to 1v1 or 1v2 that he was in, and he won almost every single one of those engagements. What do you think, Simo? Who's been popping out to you? Uh, someone you in know, the chat also said, uh, Ace, um, the Jude Sky Sidewalker said, I thought Asu was the carry on that team. So he agrees yeah. with uh, Emily. Yeah, you know, one of the, the things that I was constantly looking at throughout the tournament, maybe not, maybe has not been the mechanical skill, but the in-game leadership is, I think, is going to be a huge huge thing for a lot of these teams that are going to start coming out of the woodwork. Mendo, um, from what I understand, he's a little bit of an in-game leader for Team Canyon. He might have been able to call the plays. He might have been able to call the smokes. He was playing Sage, maybe the slow orbs. Okay, let's push. Let's do, let's do this together. 
Um, and on the side of Team Heroes, that was Emong that was pushing, that was leading mm -hmm. that charge. Maybe Bustio was getting those open frags, but it was Emong that's saying, "All right, let's push B together, or let's rotate C, or let's funnel in through A." Um, and I think that in-game leadership, some of those skills are going to be able to transfer over from some of the games that come through. Um, but having a good in-game leader is going to help those mechanical players really shine. And Bustio did just that uh, in his semifinal match. Yeah, I we 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 should also give some props to some of the teams that didn't necessarily go far because there were definitely some great moments there like team llama the fortnite pros and and and, and former pros like Sam, like we said literally decided he's going to become a valorant pro like they exceeded expectations like a lot of people I, I know our chat during the pre-shows emily <laughs> were like pretty pretty split there were a lot of Ayo, fortnite, fortnite. Stands in there. Yeah. yeah there were a lot of fortnite stands in there but oh wait were, were there Oh, yeah. I thought everyone. I thought everyone was dunking on <laughs> no, Fortnite. No, no. What? No, no, no. It was split 50-50. What did half I get for not reading Twitch chat? The other half, though, Emily, were like, "No, Fortnite's gonna surprise you. Team Llama's gonna surprise you." And to be fair, they did. They didn't make it to the, uh, you know, too far in the tournament, but an impression was made there. I think. I mean, I thought they were just fun because they kind of like stacked one side and rushed it. <laughs> that was pretty much their primary strategy for the first like few, you know, first few times we saw them. Like I appreciated that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think someone will pick up some, uh, or I think someone should pick up some rather. There was one what moment that that uh, that stands out to me from Team Llama. There was a moment on Bind where um, they were uh, Team Llama was on the attacker side. They funneled in through B. And then they rotated from the defender spawn all the way to A, and the other team was mirroring them on the op opposite side. It was like a it was like a clock, just like they were <laughs> telling the time, going around and around. I think it was, I forget what match it was or what team they were facing, but that's that's a really funny moment that sticks out to me. What about uh, team battlegrounds? Didn't make it too far, but they definitely took the tournament the most seriously going into it. They held tryouts. They had a coach. But I wonder if that extends to the next several months. I wonder if, let me generalize this question. If you were to pick, other than CSGO, which seems like the natural uh, realm for players to make the transition, if you were to pick one title that you believe we will see the most pros make the jump to Valorant, which one would you pick and why? Um... I mean, Valorant itself. I, I still think that, like, <laughs> this is kind of, like, like I, I know it's, like, fun to draft other pros from different leagues, but I do still think that the majority of the native talent is probably going to come, like, within the game itself. Um, I guess I'll go with Apex, probably. <sighs> That was my pick. <laughs> uh, you can be um, the same like ma mine. mainly just because like I think so. Not only um, I mean it is a BR, not a like you know more tactical focused shooter, but um, I do think that there's a lot of things that translate not only just the gun skills, but also the way that you use your abilities. I think is is really similar because unlike uh, something like Overwatch, where I think it's heavily dependent on synergizing your ultimates specifically um i think apex has that kind of idea where you're you're still synergizing your abilities but it's not this one giant it's not in this one giant cluster right um i think that is also really applicable to uh valorant because as much as we talk about like it's about winning your gunfights and ultimately like th that is what this game comes down to is tactics and winning gunfights I still think that the abilities uh, part is something that you absolutely have to master to be a top pro. I Fair think enough. when it comes to uh, when it comes to Apex Legends, considering how many players have already started to make their transition over, I think that some Apex players have had a little bit of struggle or have struggled to feel comfortable in the scene. I'm not exactly sure what's going on right now. I'm not too familiar with Apex Legends, um, but I think a lot of them are just willing and excited to have a new fresh start when it comes to valorant so having such an appealing title that just comes out of the woodwork and then you have a developer like riot games who have shown that they've already provided so much support in previous titles like league of legends and soon to be tft um, it's only so desirable to hop in uh, when you're still feeling a little uncertain about the developer from apex about how much support they're going to provide mm -hmm. for future tournaments right so 
So that the reason I asked that was because I think Battlegrounds is going to be one, or PUBG, I should say, where I feel like we may see a lot of pros in that scene at least attempt. And yes, I am basing a significant part of that on how they treated our tournament, but that speaks volumes to me. That that shows me that there is a serious, a level of um, desire there to at least test it out and see where they rank. And if if PUBG had done, if Team Battlegrounds had done really well in our tournament, I bet you that would have inspired a lot of PUBG pros to really grind the game and see where they would go, particularly when ranked comes out. And I still think that's going to be the case. Maybe they feel like they need a change. Maybe some of them feel like Sinatra feels with their title and they want to look elsewhere. So I really feel like we may want to keep an eye on that community and see what players are looking at. Uh, at Valorant as another viable option in their career. But I think you're right, Emily. At the end of the day, it comes down to rank. We got to wait six months and then we'll see who's, who's <laughs> next, right? I mean, that's a, yeah, good, it's go. a good point. It's a fair point. It's a very fair Not point. the rank ladder. Do you think that, Emily, do you think that all of this talk about signing players and the money being thrown around by orgs right now, does that put any pressure on Riot? Do you think it will influence them in any way or do you think they will just stay the course and nothing will change their minds in terms of a competitive esport ecosystem i mean they've already said what their plan is for next year and i think they'll stick to it there's no reason yeah. for them not to honestly especially with like again like i i know that people are throwing around a ton of money at valorant contracts right now we've all heard the rumors but like that's still a lot different than say if riot was like yo, we're starting a franchise league right off the bat. You need to put up $12 million. Uh, and and that's, you know, that's the deal. We expect your applications to look like, and then they'd probably look similar to LCS applications. That's not what they want to do with this. Um, I think it will be in the future because I think that for whatever reason, all roads lead to franchising right now. So um, I think for, to have like, I guess it's for the comfort of investors more than anything else. Uh, I think maybe two or three years down the road, that's when we'll see a franchise system maybe crop up. But for the first year, at least, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't stay the course. I mean, it it only looks good for them, right? Because they all, all they have to do is focus on putting out like an entertaining, fun game, supporting the the tournaments that are come out by like come out with third party organizers like i know for our tournament uh it, it was like insanely easy to work with riot on it mm -hmm. um and and i imagine that most people have a really similar experience since they've been so good about promoting like any and all valorant content um through their social channels they've been insanely good about as we said previously communicating um with the patches with with servers with uh even with all of the like in in my opinion warranted criticism around the anti-cheat system um i think they've been pretty like pretty upfront about all of that right and they've responded almost immediately to everything um and all they have to do that is do that for another like year uh while the scene develops and they look amazing like i, I don't think there's any pressure on them to change what they're doing Simo, let me ask you this. I always feel like you can get a good gauge on the health of an industry based on how well the casters are working. And I truly <laughs> believe this. And I, I know Oof. this because I was a freelancer too. So like, tell me from your vantage point, man, like you're grinding, you're looking for tournaments to cast, you're constantly knocking on doors. So like, how, what is the landscape like we hear about the major tournaments? How often are you finding amateur tournaments or lower level tournaments? Like how many events are you able to cast a week like how healthy is the scene right now well considering it's still in closed beta there is a lot left to be desired for how many tournaments are put on everyone wants to run a valorant tournament but they also all want to run them on the same time it's usually weekends uh, valorant tournaments are running so having to pick and choose is very difficult sometimes um but that means that throughout the week there's a lot of space and i think actually funny enough espn esports capitalized you guys capitalize really well on a perfect time to run the tournament because all of them are always going to run during um the weekend but having one monday to wednesday especially a finals on wednesday who's going to be contesting for that wednesday spot no one it's a pretty good spot and a pretty good time um to to to, to put it in there but however i think there's going to be um a lot of 
higher level third party organizers that are still waiting for the full launch, mm. still waiting for better observing tools, still waiting for Riot to be in conversations with your ESLs and your dream hacks. I'm sure they are already talking, but the talks are more like, we're going to wait till you launch the game and we're going to wait for X and we're going to wait for Y and we're going to wait for Z and then we'll start to do what we do. Right now, like we talked about earlier, it's just teams that want to capitalize on the hubbub, the buzz of the game, and they're doing so well. Like The tournaments are coming out well. Um, but from the caster side, there's still uh, a lot more that I think third-party organizers, I think, can do. But it'll be a little bit before um, you'll see a lot of casting work come through. All right, so you've been uh, listening for the past hour to a conversation about a very eventful week in Valorant. We're going to be bringing you a lot more Valorant content on this channel. If you're not following us already, please follow us. Uh, you're already here at twitch.tv slash ESPN Esports. We also have plenty of Valorant content on our website, ESPN.com slash Esports, as well as on our YouTube channel, which just passed 50K, which is awesome because we started very recently. Uh, uh, YouTube.com slash ESPN Esports. Yes, let me just pat on the back here. This is on behalf of the entire <laughs> team. It's not just me, obviously. It's a whole amazing team uh, and me that have uh, put all of this together. So they deserve all the credit. Uh, but let's just get some final thoughts as we wind it down here. Uh, just thinking about what we think will happen with the with we've talked about a lot of these points already, but just something that you predict will happen in the next six months to a year. Anything you want to that comes to mind, whether it's a player, whether it's a tournament, whether it's uh, a, a, an update to the game. Uh, what do you think will come in Valorant in the next six months to a year? Simo, let's start with you. Okay, um, I was thinking a little bit about the extra pressure that you asked earlier to Emily. Does Riot have any extra added pressure with making a perfect esports scene? And I kind of thought of it as, does a hot dog stand have to perform extra more crucially <laughs> if Gordon Ramsay's asking for a hot dog? I think the hot dog stand's still going to make a hot dog no matter who's asking for it. I think Riot has learned a lot from League, from the esports scene. They've learned all the hiccups. They, they've learned about uh, network infrastructure. They've learned how to answer to the fans. They've learned how to talk to the fans. Casual, hardcore, esports, they have learned to talk to everybody from the entire spectrum. Um, and with that, they are able to, I think, execute a, a really solid esports scene. And like Emily was saying earlier, it's going to be those third party organizers that are going to be pushing that front first. They're letting it grow. If it doesn't grow, they will start to step in and see if they can help it out or help push it along. Um, in terms of players to keep my eye on, I actually uh, want to keep my eye on Steel, uh, another. Um, team member that has been a part of the, the, the I buy power situation, somebody mm -hmm. that was affected by it. I think he's also been playing a little bit of Valorant. He's also been grinding. He's been in some of the scrims. He's been playing with some of the players who we've talked about time and time again. I think I'm going to keep my eye on him because he may look to have his own redemption arc in Valorant. He had a little bit of a rede redemption arc in Overwatch. He played a little bit of McCree, decided it wasn't for him. And then now I think Valorant may be the game for him where he, uh, he comes back swinging. Nice. Um, I mean, my big thing that I keep returning to that I've harped on this entire <laughs> time is I want to see the launch in, in both South Korea and China, because I think this game by design is, uh, you know, poised to take off in both of those markets. And those are two very, very important esports markets to hit. Um, and I think Riot hit both of them with League of Legends. And I think that that in and of itself tells me, especially with Tencent presumably uh, distributing the game in China, um, but I think that sets them in a really unprecedented position for an FPS in China because, you know, FPS games haven't really taken off in China like other uh, games that have become esports have. Uh, the last one to really get popular was Crossfire. <laughs> um, mm. I know that like uh, there have been a few uh, Chinese CSGO teams that have kind of maybe pushed a little bit into uh, into doing better. Like Tai Lu comes to mind as kind of the only one, to be honest. Um, FPX aside, because that kind of seemed like a, a mess and they were picking up a Western team anyway. Uh, so, I mean, I think that is going to be huge for me and that will happen within the next year so 
of all things Valorant, that's actually what I have my eye on the most is the South the launches in South Korea and China. Yeah, two really good things to keep an eye on. For me, it's going to be how they refresh the game. I think that uh, that's very important for the casual mm -hmm. gamer, obviously. I think that it's going to succeed as an eSport, my humble opinion. I think Riot have the blueprint. Uh, everything that Emily said, I agree with. And I think that uh, this will be a success wow. as a competitive game. <laughs> uh, I do. I, 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 just, I just believe this it. This is I the opposite that. of our pod show. Yeah, where you, where where we disagree you disagree about everything. with everything. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should not be on this show together anymore. I don't know. Uh, we we got to just keep disagreeing, Emily. No, uh, no, it's fine to agree. And I do agree. Uh, here's the here's here's the thing. We are already going to get some changes. Uh, if you believe the data miners, uh, here is a sneak peek uh, at the possible slash probable new map uh, that uh, data miners have found in the patch. Uh, we don't. Uh, Emily, do we do we have a name for this map? Um, I had heard that it was going to be called Venice or something, something along Venetian lines, but, uh, I don't know that for a fact. That's also presuming a lot based on the fact that there's a boathouse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. We're not calling um, it Yacht Town right yeah, now. We're calling it yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think, and our video producer said this before we hopped on that, um, the, every map has kind of a an idea or like a theme behind it. Like Simo and, and our producer Daniel were talking about this where like there's, you know, portals for binds. There's presumably the verticality and ropes of uh <laughs> of split, which I still <laughs> dislike immensely. Um uh and there's the idea of three uh bomb sites on Haven. So or three spike sites Spikes. on yeah. Haven. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, I, so, you know, I think that, uh, I can't tell what this map is like, not gimmick, but like, I can't tell what it's going to be, but just by looking at it, uh, right now, the kind of midsection looks pretty open to me though. We, we also get new, uh, possibly, probably new agents as well. Right. I think there might've been a couple leaked by now. Uh, have we seen them? Have we heard anything about them? If this is in fact a thing? Uh, not, not, really. not that I think is anything concrete. There is a couple Fair of enough. voice lines that have uh, come through. But again, still don't have a visual of what this person looks like. Don't know what they do. May, might be a vampire. So we might see part of the Twilight Saga unfold in Valorant. Not oh, sure great. yet. We'll have to see. <laughs> great. Wow. <laughs> Are they going to be in daylight and start sparking? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 oh. yeah. Fingers permanently crossed. smoking on on bind they can never catch <laughs> right. on bind yeah worst worst vampire ever in daylight yeah. just disintegrates <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's hilarious uh with that uh that'll be it for our valorant conversation a lot happened this week so uh if you're catching us in the tail end uh as soon as we go offline the full vod will be available at twitch.tv slash espn esports so watch us then uh emily and i you can see regularly here on our twitch channel also a lot of content and written pieces espn.com slash esports and youtube.com slash espn esports simo tell us what's coming up for you and where to where people can find you yeah, I'm pretty much Simo was taken on all my platforms because the username Simo was taken. Um, so I couldn't get that. So I just made it Simo was taken across all platforms. Uh, commentating a, a big Toronto Valorant tournament coming this weekend. But other than that, just waiting to see what's around the corner and hoping it's just more Valorant commentary. Give me, give me some hope. How good is the Toronto Valorant scene? Give me, give well, me hope for my hometown. Here, here's a little bit. Ziff is competing from Team Llama. Oh, so wow, we okay. already have a little bit of action going on. So Speaking of redemption stories. Yeah, exactly. Just taking a dip a little bit in the competitive scene. All right, very cool. So you can check that out. Simo was taken, as we mentioned. But thank you very much for watching our Valorant discussion. This will definitely not be the last time you see Valorant content on this channel. If you're not following us already, please hit that follow button because there will be plenty more to come. Goodbye. <laughs>